Okay, welcome to our Zephyr Wellness event. Um, this is the Helping Kids and Families Thrive During Distance Learning. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen with some information first. Um, so for all of the attendees, you do not have um, your mics or video on. We've turned those off. Um, you will notice on the bottom of your screen, there's three things that you can do um, during this presentation. You can use the chat function. Um, we won't be using the raise your hand function during this um, presentation and then the Q&A. The chat and the Q&A are ways that you can um, leave a question during the presentation. We've also taken all of your questions from your RSVP form and added those um, to um, the presentation and the uh, presenters, including those in here. So if you wanna use the chat tonight, you can, um, if you see at the bottom there where that blue um, oval is, all panelists and attendees, if you wanna send a chat to everybody, you make sure that that's selected. If you just want the panelists to see um, your comment, then just you use that drop down, and then you can select that. And then in the Q&A, you can um, submit a question and then you just type it in there and send that to us. And then um, in the chat, I'm gonna drop um, some information in there um, about our presenter's book, her website, um, as well as all of our um, social media accounts and then our presenters' social media accounts um, if you want to connect as well. And um, Tony, are you ready? Yeah, let's see here. <laughs> yeah, well, sorry everyone. I, for whatever reason, my camera is not coming on and I swear I did not do that on purpose, so. <laughs> Yeah, thank you all for uh, joining us tonight for our Zephyr Wellness Program. My name is Tony Pierce and I'm the Director of Student Support Services at Matamidi Public Schools. The Zephyr Wellness Program was an initiative that began this year to help students, staff, and community members learn, grow, and support each other on wellness issues. This has included community conversations just like this evening, student engagement, and staff development to support student wellness and supporting access to co-located mental health services in all our schools. This year's program scope is made possible because of the generosity of the Matamidi Area Educational Foundation through last year's Fund a Need fundraiser. Thank you to MAFE and all who have contributed to this program. We could not do it without you. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm gonna hand it over to our superintendent, Barb Dufferin. Thanks, Tony, and thank you all for joining us. Um, before I introduce Dr. Heitner, I'm going to just mention that was Alice Seufert, our communication specialist at the beginning, and uh, she will be our moderator, and I, I think you could tell that, but she'll be our moderator for this evening, and she will be helping to watch um, the chat. Uh, Tony and I will as well, so that we can, can help uh, Dr. Heitner answer your questions, although she is going to just stop a couple of times for questions during this. Yeah. Um, she won't just stop her flow as soon as a question comes in. So we're going to help with that. But I am pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Devorah Heitner, who I've known for many years now, and I've been following and learning from her for um, many years. And um, I, every time I hear um, Dr. Heitner speak, I take away something new, um, or I'm just affirmed by, <laughs> by what she has to say, because you'll find she has a very affirming way. And, um, and I think you'll all feel okay when we leave here about how we're doing with distance learning as parents and um, as teachers, because I see quite a few of you in there, teachers. So thank you for coming as well. Um, I, you might also recognize, uh, Devorah's name because last year I did host um, a book conversation, a number of book conversations around her book, Screenwise. Um, and you can see I've gotten a lot of use out of it over the years. And um, one of the reasons I chose Screenwise to share and why I asked her to come and speak to us this year also is because I always appreciate 
Devorah's um, perspective on really cultivating that thought, thoughtful digital citizens through kindness and empathy. And one of the things that I really took away from uh, Devorah as a parent is the idea that I may not understand all the technology and the social media that my kids are using, but I do have the wisdom of experience as a parent. And so that is one thing that um, I really appreciate about what I've learned from Devorah. Though my kids may not, every time I mention to them that I am the wise one in the room, um, they may not appreciate that, but I, I certainly I certainly do um, appreciate that perspective from, from Devorah. Um, so you read a little bit about her in our um, intro to in, in our publications and our emails and things that you've received, but I will just repeat that um, Dr. Devorah Heitner has her PhD in Media Technology and Society from Northwestern University. She also taught at DePaul University and she's been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Education Week, among other, other places. And so um, she's an expert, she's engaging, and she's insightful. And we're really excited that you could join us this evening, Devorah. And um, she was scheduled to come and join us on the 14th and 15th. And when we contacted her to talk about doing, doing the Zoom um, with all of you, she said, you know, I think it's possible people might want me to come a little earlier than the 14th and 15th, and she made that work for us. So we're very thankful that you were able to do that. So I will stop talking, and thank you again for all of you who are joining us this evening, and please welcome Dr. Devorah Heitner. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you, and I wish I was there with you in person. I think we all wish that we could all be together, and I'm sure you're all missing one another uh, tonight. And in general, I think so many of us really appreciate the community of other parents at our children's school as an extension of the school community, and uh, it's, it's hard to be apart. So I hope tonight we get a little bit of that feeling of community, and uh, you'll also hear questions from other people in the community and learn from one another. Um, I'm dealing with this too. I have a fifth grader who's been home for four weeks and it's very, very challenging. So I just want to start by saying, you know, I feel you. I know it's really hard to work from home and have your kids at home, even with the best, incredible remote learning plan, really great, you know, participation and lessons coming home from your kid's teacher. It's very hard to facilitate your kid's education at home. And it's really, none, none of us were quite prepared for this. So I just wanna start from that place and say, I can share with you what I see from my research, what I'm seeing talking with other parents and other school communities around the country right now. And I also just wanna say that you're doing the best you can. And I'm gonna keep coming back to that. We're all doing the best we can and the best we can might look different on different days, uh, but truly just by sticking with our kids and making this work, we're providing our kids an important example of how resilient we can all be and how much we care about our community and getting through this. So I'm gonna share my screen for a little while and share a few slides, but then I'm gonna also come, come back and pop my, my face back in here. So let's see, let me share my screen and... Okay. Uh, that should look okay. Someone let me know if that's not working. So we know that technology is incredible and it touches all aspects of our lives. And if you leave your phone in one room, your preschooler or first grader might ring it to you because they know how precious it is, it, it, it is to you or they know that you, they want to use it. So even before we were all sheltering in place at home, our, our phones and our tablets and our laptops had this kind of talismanic relationship, right? With, and, and, and we're very attached to them. But now they're our portal to the world and the people we're not able to see. In some cases, it could be our uh, elderly parents who live just down the road that we're not able to see. In some cases, it could be family and friends that live halfway around the world or an hour away, right? But whatever the distance is, whether it's folks right around the corner, like friends from school or folks really far away, the computer and the phone are bringing those people to us. So this is a really precious time. And it's also a time when we're experimenting with tons of new ways of connecting. Many of us have green lit, lit and said yes to apps that we wouldn't have 
uh, approved for our kids a few weeks ago, but we want them to be able to connect with peers. Many of us are struggling with these questions. So I wanna dive into some of that with you this evening. And then again, happy to take questions and think through with you what I've learned from my research and what I think can be helpful. Uh, we're all this guy right now. Every single one of us is uh, trying to conduct our professional lives, mentor our kids, be the lead learner at home, facilitate what's coming home from school. Many of us are trying to do this with multiple kids um, at multiple different levels. And m some of our work is more intense than usual. I know many of us are going through a lot at work in terms of transitions, in terms of emergency plans, we may be supporting our teams in whole new ways. Uh, there's all kinds of stresses for all of us going on in this you know, really difficult situation that we're all collectively sharing. And so we all kind of laughed, I think, when, when this guy on the BBC had his toddlers bur burst in on him and his facade of professional remove was kind of, in some sense, interrupted by the fact that he had these adorable children. Uh, and then you see actually um, his wife, their mother come in and scoop them up, right? And they've done interviews about this. So they've, they've talked about this moment and they're actually sheltering in place in South Korea now. So they're, they're dealing with what we're all dealing with, right? With these same boisterous cuties. And, but we're all this guy now. And if one of the things that's positive that comes from this, right? And I'm not a real silver lining person. I mean, obviously an international, pandemic where lots of lives are being lost. And I'm, I'm not looking for lots of upsides here, but I'll say if, if a way that we grow stronger as a society is that we recognize that people have lives and people have parents and people have children and that comes with them as professionals and we recognize that for men and for women and people of all ages, that's really important. If we humanize our colleagues and our bosses and the people who work under us that's really great. So that's happening, right? You may be on calls with colleagues, you'll see their kids, you'll hear their dog. We're all in this boat together. And I think it's going to humanize the workplace right now. But in the meantime, we need a lot of empathy to deal with it. And we need empathy for ourselves. And many of us, it it's, can be a, a reorganization or an attitude adjustment to even talk. I know as a woman, I was socialized never to talk about my children when I was an academic in the workplace. And clearly we're all in a different situation and many of us are balancing leading our children's education and their entertainment and their safety and their well-being and their nap times with uh with our work and that's coming through this is also not homeschooling home this is a picture of people homeschooling homeschooling sounds kind of cool right homeschooling is something people do in community homeschooling is something people do with resources um, I personally love school schooling and I would never want to homeschool, but just to even call this homeschooling, it, what we're all doing is, is a problem because we're actually not really homeschooling. We're facilitating our kids' school education, which by the way, they're still getting, thank goodness, from qualified professionals, that's how I feel, um, teachers and subject matter experts and people who actually know things about teaching. I would not say that I want to be my child's teacher. And again, this is, this is not, to, not to say anything negative about any of you who are also homeschoolers or have been, because I think that's amazing, right? But this is not homeschooling, because in homeschool communities, people have community, and they meet up, and they use resources in the community that are not available to us right now. We are facilitating our kids' educations at home while school buildings are shut down, and society in many ways is shut down. Not only is there no school, there's no gymnastics, there's no dance, there's no taekwondo, there's no soccer, right? So all the things that keep our kids busy and on an even keel and sometimes stress us out as parents, but we probably love them more than we don't or we would stop, all of those activities are gone too. And so are the libraries and the museums and all the, and you know, I also live in the upper Midwest, so I know all about all the indoor places that we go with our kids to survive the winter. And all of those places are closed, right? So we are in a really tricky situation. The good news is we do have the resources of the schools. Um, they're just translated to us in this new way. So we do have you know, professional educators sending home things that we can do with our kids, um, but our kids may need a lot of help. Younger children may need help just even accessing the technology. Not, you know, not every first grader has the keyboarding skills or the literacy skills to be able to just access a Google Hangout with her class. Uh, your, you know, fifth grader may have used a, a certain kind of technology before, but they were step by step getting directed on how to use it 
and maybe they're using it on an unfamiliar piece of equipment at home or in a totally new way. Um, all of our kids uh, are very accustomed to the routine of school and home is going to be different no matter what, no matter how many sticky notes you have and how many rainbow uh, schedules you may have put on the fridge. And, um, uh, you know, I'm looking at you type A parents, but some of you may, may, may not have done that. But if you did that because you thought that was a good idea, you're still not going to be able to replicate the incredible routine of school where your kids' bodies are timed, frankly, to like have to pee at a certain time because that's when they go to the bathroom. School is a very structured place. Their bodies are timed to expect exercise at a certain time because that's when they have recess. And now your kid is home. The, you know, the fridge is always there. The backyard, if you have one, is always there. There are all kinds of other distractions. There are siblings. Um, there are pets it's a very different environment than school. So I wanna talk about that. And I just, I just wanna acknowledge that that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with kids who've had their whole routine stripped away, um, a place where they're comfortable, teachers that they love. All of that is something that they're missing. And just like many of us are struggling to adapt our work to the home environment. And I miss my office and my co-working space and my coffee shop to where I got writing done. Your child is missing all of those places. And so, we have to figure out which pieces of that are possible for us to do at home. And we have to accept and mourn what we can't do at home and be kind of at peace as much as possible with that. Here's a family that I really admire who has three under 10. So my, my, my heart goes out to them, right? Three under 10 and both parents work together in a small business that they run. They're running that business at home with their you know eight, five, and I think two year old. And they made the eating side of the table and the working side of the table. Um, I know that we're also doing a lot more meal prep. Uh, my kitchen has never been as active as it's been for the last four weeks. We're all dealing with everyone being home all the time and figuring out those spaces and places is half the battle with just learning from home right now. And so anything we can do to give kids a little corner of the table that's a learning space or a certain spot for reading or any place where we can just keep the school stuff, right? The folders that came home, the tech that you're using, anything like that, that's always in a place that you can find it. All of that will help reduce stress. And we have to acknowledge that almost all of us are using spaces. I mean, unless you had a school wing in your house, all of us are using spaces in multiple ways. And so um, getting kids involved and taking care of those spaces can certainly be a good learning experience. In general, this is a great time for kids to learn how to do all kinds of tasks from putting away dishes to doing laundry. Some of you may have already ha have kids who excelled at those things. If not, you know, your kid can be the kid in college who doesn't uh, ruin all their laundry, right? This is a great time to learn those things and, and to figure out how you're going to share the tasks of um, keeping the learning spaces going. Here's another thing that a lot of us are learning now that we have our kids at home with us is that we have no idea how long things take. A lot of things that we might do with our kids take very little time. So going over fractions uh, might take 10 minutes a day. You might think, oh, we need an hour uh, you know, to, to work on social studies. Maybe 22 minutes is gonna be great, right? So trial and error is one way you'll learn. You can certainly uh, talk to other parents also and see how it's going. This is an activity that these same friends with the three under 10 constructed as thinking it would be a really good unplugged activity for their kids and thinking it would keep them quite busy for quite a long time, you know, to find a rough thing and a fuzzy thing and a cold thing, right? This took eight minutes, eight minutes. Okay. So that was a good learning activity, learning experience for them to think, oh, okay, well, now we know that that's how long that takes. And now what will we do with the rest of the time? Uh, so as the teachers who are on this call know that every time you do something new, you experiment to see how long it will take. So parents are learning this right now. And, and, and for many of us, we have to adjust our expectation for what the school day will look like, that the formal learning day for most of our students will not be nearly as long uh, as a school day at school. And it may involve also several breaks or some kids may be able to get everything done in the morning and then spend their afternoon on other activities. <clears throat> But it's very important that we don't have the expectation, and probably most of you are past this, but that our kids are going to sit down for six hours with just a short recess and lunch, and that they're just going to kind of study all day. Um, that wouldn't be realistic for high school, and it's definitely not realistic for elementary and middle. I want to talk a little bit about the news that we're all being bombarded with. Many of us go to bed with our phones, and we wake up and we check our phones. 
Um, we know that there's some really horrendous things going on in the world that those things are getting closer and closer to us and to our lives. Um, I'm thinking of you, some of you may have already lost people. Most of us will know someone who's affected by this in some way if we don't already. And we read the news and we process and we stress. And I'm not telling anyone to hide their head in the sand and not read the news. And certainly as safety issues come up and new information comes out, we wanna be aware. But if you can either assign one person who maybe has a strong constitution to check the news in your family and share only what needs to be shared, or if you can assign times for the adults to briefly check the news, that's the most important, and pick maybe one lo local and one national trusted news source that you might check briefly every day. You probably do not wanna be looking at the news morning, noon, and night. You probably don't wanna be looking at news right before you go to bed. And it's very important that we know what news our kids are hearing. You may think your middle grades kid or your middle school kid isn't getting the news, but they may be getting memes, news filtered through YouTubers, all kinds of ways that news gets to our kids, even if they're not sitting down and plugging into, you know, public radio stations, CNN, other, you know, Fox News, they might not be sitting down and kind of getting the news like the adults do. They might not sit down and read your local paper cover to cover, but they are absorbing what's happening and they're also watching us read. And even our young early readers are, are hearing the ways we talk. They're seeing our facial expression as we furrow our brows and hunch over our phones. So it's very important that if our kids are interested in what's going on, um, you know, with small kids, if they're not asking, I mean, I would just tell them enough um, to make sense, right? Why do we need to wash our hands? Why do we need to stay away from friends? But I would not give them, you know, more information than they're asking for unless there's a safety issue. As, in, as questions come up, I would answer in an age appropriate way. If we can't go see grandma, let's talk about why we can't go see grandma. Um, this is an illness that is especially dangerous for older people, right? But again, I would not give too much information to kids who are too young if they're not asking and if it's not necessary. But for older kids, I would continue to come back to what are you hearing? What are your friends saying? Because it's important that we can help put out fires from misinformation. And trust me, YouTube and social media and memes are filled with misinformation and also help uh, our kids deal with their very real and, and very understandable fears. This is not a time where we need to lie and tough it out and you know say we're not afraid if we are afraid, but we do want to keep things pretty upbeat as much as we can. And uh, again, this is not you know sort of like completely you know fake it and lie, but as upbeat, as calm as we can be, which may mean we don't read the news right around our kids. And it may mean we need to turn down our consumption of news a little bit. Um, if, if we're real news junkies, uh, that can be a hard habit to turn off. I know I'm married to a journalist. It's not easy for us to turn it off, but it's really important that we guard our own mental health right now so that we can be strong for our kids. I wanna stop here. I know we're early on and there's a lot more that I wanna talk about, but I, I wanna stop and just check the chat for questions now. Um, and I think Tony was going to feed those to me. But do you see some questions coming up in the chat now that I can address, or should I go on? I don't see any in the uh, chat right now, but uh, I could ask a couple that were asked um, previously. Yeah. Why don't we do that? And then I'm going to move through this. But I just want to think about what I've said already about sort of routines, news, anything around that. Yes, this one might be a good one. Um, is all screen time created equal? So if there, you were just talking about screens, such as watching videos of a symphony versus watching Daniel Tiger versus learning. I mean, absolutely not. And I would say even had I come next week and things were, you know, what we call the old days, right, where we were all in a room together and we weren't dealing with an international pandemic, I would have said screen time isn't such a helpful, and in fact, I'm gonna go here and say, screen time is not the most helpful way to think about tech use. I would really think about the qualitative experience. Are your kids learning a creative skill when they're watching YouTube or um, other kinds of television? Are they creating things? Are they making movies, writing books, making zines right now? In other words, are they using tech in ways that are helping them. And that would include social. It's very important that our kids stay connected to peers as much as possible. Um, and I'll put the caveat that some kids may need that less than others right now. There are kids who are doing okay. They may be introverted. They might like to FaceTime or um, do some chat with one or two friends, but maybe they don't need to see 
you know, everyone constantly. So I'm not saying that we should pressure kids to do more socially than they might desire right now. There are also a lot of younger kids who may be just getting most of their comfort from parents right now. But for kids who are very connected to friends, who were connecting with friends previously on games and texting, even more so right now, those, those spaces are gonna be important. What we wanna look at with all the tech, especially right now, is is it supporting my kids' mental health? Connecting with friends can support kids' mental health. Watching a really fun movie with their family, playing dance dance and getting some exercise on a cold or rainy day, all of the and can support both physical and mental health and, the, and help kids get to sleep at night. What we don't wanna see is tech use that's stressing kids out. So that could be negative interactions with peers. If we have kids who have gotten kind of into um, you know, group texts that aren't going very well, I would look at that. I would also look at uh, make sure that kids are not just in the wild west of YouTube completely unsupervised. And the younger your kids are, the more I would love to see them in a walled garden, you know, a Disney channel or Netflix or watching shows on PBS or shows that we know what they are as parents, especially because we are multitasking as parents. We're not in this kind of ideal mentoring situation where it's like, let's learn this lovely new tech together. And I have all the time in the world and I've planned this with you. We're all thrust into this situation where we may very well be doing a conference call while our kid is learning. And I think we'd all rather see our kid doing Geometry Dash and, and programming in Scratch and Google hangouting with their class or writing a book during that time than just completely unmoored and connected in a place where there's a lot of negative content. So like YouTube and places like that, I would reserve for when, for older kids who have better judgment, who've already been trusted in those spaces, that might be a different call. But for younger kids um, where you're not sure about their discernment, I would, I would let them be in those unmoderated places where anything goes only when I'm available to supervise or when, you know, when there's a parent available to supervise because there are, there are some really negative things on there. Whereas the kinds of content that you might otherwise feel like, you know, a virtuous parent for limiting like the Disney channel, it, it may, that may be a better place to be if you cannot be with kids and they need some recreational time. Now that's not saying you can't turn it off, take the channel changer, say you're going to go play with Legos or you can play, you know, with your sibling or you can play with the cat, right? You can certainly give your kids other options. I'm not suggesting that kids need to be kind of plugged in all the time. But I would look at tech more qualitatively right now and say, what aspect of my child's needs are they meeting with this? Are they meeting a creative need? Are they meeting a need to escape and watching a fun movie right now or reading an ebook? Are they meeting a need to see friends and, and playing the game with friends or doing social media or hangouts with friends or a Zoom chat with friends if you've allowed that um, or any kind of social media if you have older kids? that could be really great. So you just want to figure out what function it's fulfilling and then make sure it's not interfering too much with the assigned learning that they need to do with school and with sleep. So sleep is really crucial right now for mental and physical health and so is the assigned learning. Your kid has a lot more time though than they did before, right? Because they're not going to all those activities, they're not going to school, they're not commuting anywhere. Uh, so they may well have some, a little bit more time to play Minecraft right now. They have a little more time to play with their Nintendo Switch. So you have to choose your battles right now as a parent with screens and really look at, is this harmful? Is this just harmful to me because I believe as a parent something, maybe I have an arbitrary number in mind. I would focus much more on the quality of the experience and the effect on your child than on the number of minutes right now. So I hope that's really helpful. Tony, is there another question that I can address before I go on? Yeah, uh, we had something, you know, talking about uh, maybe some more creative ways for kids without cell phones to engage with peers that don't involve uh, social media or FaceTime. Is there, are there other ideas uh, for mil uh, sorry, middle school and elementary students to, to engage with friends outside of the hobby? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is really tricky because even physical distancing may or may not be safe enough and it's obviously hard to tell you know a six-year-old like you can play with your friends or or talk to your friend you know in person without and stay six feet apart or ten feet apart so I'd say that's you know and I, I don't I'm not a physician so I don't want to give any any advice here except to say that we probably are all gonna be probably potentially tightening up any any in-person time together based on what I'm seeing and reading uh, but certainly things like chalk drawings where everyone on the block is doing a chalk drawing. Um, people in my community in Evanston, Illinois who live near the hospital are all putting up signs 
uh, to say how much they appreciate the people who work at the hospital. Any kind of mask making that you can do or, or PPE um, work or collecting food for people in your community who need food, anything that's safe to do right now that's altruistic is a really great way to get kids involved in something collective bigger than they are and also it just feels really good I mean obviously we want to do the right thing for all the right reasons but when we feel a lack of control helping others helps us feel better and our kids are no different so if your child has um, extended family you know in my family we're communicating with my mother-in-law every single night she's been completely isolated for four weeks she had not seen another human being in four weeks she leaves her laundry outside of her door and we pick it up and take it away um, and so my son and I and, and my husband, we all play Boggle with her by FaceTime. She shakes up the actual Boggle and takes a picture and texts it to us and we play by FaceTime. So it's like a use of technology, but to play a very old school game. I can tell you we're all a lot better at Boggle now, but it's obviously incredibly important for um, my son's grandmother to have this time with us, but it's also important for us to have the time with her. And so we've been really clear with my son that that's really important. I know in our religious community and through other community connections, we would be able to connect with other seniors who might need that kind of connection. That's the kind of thing that could be really helpful for your child right now and could be a really collective uh, thing. Another, another thing I'm seeing families do is um, if you're still walking around in your community, putting up signs in the window, either signs of encouragement or specific people doing it around holidays or around fun things. People in my community did it around St. Patrick's Day and then other people did a shamrock hunt uh, to find shamrocks in the windows, you know, and that was very sweet. So that kind of thing is really nice. Um, if your child can do one-to-one -one peer work right now or is able to do uh, any kind of, of work in class with classmates, that can be a really nice way for them to connect with smaller groups of peers. One of the things we're seeing is that sometimes that large group is really overwhelming for some kids, especially younger kids. So like the Google Hangout with everyone for some kids is a lot. So anything that they can do with small groups and if parents can facilitate that, uh, that can be really positive. So um, another thing we're doing in my community is we're just starting this, but it's a kind of a parent sponsored book club uh, where all the kids are gonna read books separately and then we're gonna get on a call in a few weeks. So we're really allowing a ton of time. We don't wanna stress people out, uh, but then the kids are gonna get on a call in a few weeks and, and chat about the book. And so that's a nice way to bring folks together. Um, okay, I wanna talk a little bit about relationships and time management. We're all, I think, under stress in our relationships. Uh, folks are living together in small quarters. My son is a singleton and he's quite mad right now that he's quarantined without siblings and he's let us know in no uncertain terms that we've made, done a grievous thing to him. I have let him know that many children will sell him their siblings for a low price when this is all over. I hope that's not the experience that you are having. I hope that your kids are pulling together and banding together and having a great time, or at least as, you, as, as we like to say in the parenting world, at, at least every, loving every other minute. But I know that it, this is a very tough time and again, siblings mostly are not used to, if, you're, if you have school age kids, they're not used to being together all day, every day. So any small challenges or slightly annoying habits a sibling might have are gonna be magnified. They're gonna, you know, your siblings may be your main company during the day. So these are challenging relationships. Our own relationships with our spouses and our partners right now are challenging. Certainly negotiating with um, any, any of you are negotiating multiple households right now super challenging, really stressful. So we just need to give our relationships and everyone we're relating to so much grace. This is not the time to kind of call out our kids, obviously for every sort of misstep, right? It's not that we wanna to tolerate super negative behaviors, but we also wanna give our kids a lot of understanding. Everything that we are doing as adults that soothes us, that helps us, many of those things our kids don't have access to, right? So our kids are really struggling right now, and I think we just need to honor, and a lot of them may be regressing. You may find a kid who was very independent going to school on their own, walking to school independently or biking to school, maybe very clingy right now. All of that is very understandable, and we just want to accept as much as we can with grace. Um, uh, Brene Brown uh, has a lovely podcast talking about how parents in this situation can communicate with one another and talk about what percent they're at. So if I come home and say, wow, I had a great time doing that webinar, but now I'm at 40%. And my husband might say, well, I had a really tough day doing my reporting and I'm at 40%. And then we're at that, we have that 20% gap. 
Uh, those of you who are solo parenting are like, well, that sounds great. It's good to have a gap with someone else. Uh, but the fact is, no matter who you're doing this with, whether it's just you alone living with one child or you are co-parenting with your partner and you have five kids at home, all of us can have a gap on certain days. And so I really like uh, Brene Brown's um, kind of structure around that. And just being able to communicate about that gap is really helpful in our relationships. And with older kids, being really honest, like, I'm really tired right now. I can't negotiate about this with you. I need you to show up is an acceptable thing to say. Um, time management is something we're putting on our kids more. If you are going off to do some work, but you don't want your kid to miss that Google Hangout with his class at noon, one thing you can do is um, work with your kid to figure out what's going to work. Should we set the timer on the microwave? Are we going to start to teach you how to calendar? For older kids who already know how to calendar, maybe that's a shared calendar right now with parents and kids for a longer term work. Um, some of us are having good success with writing down the things for the day. Another thing you can do is if there's some choice in your child's day, that's going to bring back some of the power that they've lost. So maybe you want to work with them to come up with a list, maybe of five or six things that are happening today. Maybe, you know, some things are not optional, like feed the cat, right? Um, she's not going to be very happy if you don't do that. But maybe some of the other things on the list don't have to happen every single day, but they have to happen a certain number of times a week. And so your child can choose. Um, anything we can give our kids a choice about right now at this time when their choice of what to eat may be limited, their choice of who to play with is obviously very limited. Um, any choices we can give them, even these small little bits of choice will help them get through the day and working with them on managing time. And, and again, picking battles too. So it may not, you may not feel like everyone needs to be up as early as they were during the school year, but you don't want kids outlasting you, staying up later than you. For those of you of older middle schoolers or any high schoolers, right? That's really important too. We don't want to have our kids become so nocturnal as teenagers that we don't see them uh, because then we don't know when they're going to bed and we don't know if they're going to bed. So that's really important. It may, they may want to stay up late and sleep in. We may decide that that's okay. But again, you don't want them literally flipping the clock and going to the point where you haven't seen them in days because they're sleeping when you're awake. Okay, I would have said this if I was there, and I'll, I, I know Barb's been hearing me say this for years, but I just want to say at my core philosophy of screens and tech with kids is that we want to do more mentoring than monitoring. This is not an ideal time to do like really thoughtful mentoring. So we also have to pick our battles. If there's a situation that you don't know how to deal with or a piece of technology that your kid wants access to or an app that they want to learn and you can't deal with it right now, it is totally legit to say, I don't have time. To deal with this right now, let's look at it on the weekend. Um, I'm not sure how to be safe on that. I have to wait until tonight to look at this. So these are your options for right now. We don't want to just get into green lighting things just to green light. At the same time, many of us who would prefer, especially for elementary parents who might prefer their child socialized predominantly in person, we don't have access to that right now. So a great question to ask yourself if you're going to green light a social app, for example, for an elementary schooler, which again, usually most of us maybe wouldn't do, is really looking at what's the benefit to uh, cost or what's the, what's the concern. If you're not sure, maybe it's something you could try. Like if you want to green light something like a Facebook Messenger or Discord, which is uh, an app where kids can talk while they game, maybe you want to try it, but just like with a cousin or with someone where you know the, the other parents pretty well, and maybe you agree with the other parents, okay, we're going to try this and see how it goes. And that mentoring would also be asking for feedback, making decisions. Uh, we don't always have a lot of choices about what devices we're using right now. Many of us are giving our kids our spare devices, if there are any, in the house. Many of us are sharing. Um, so for, for sure, a part of our mentoring should be looking at our own privacy. If you don't want your eighth grader to read all your email and you're giving them your Chromebook, that's something to think about. If you don't want them ordering things on Amazon with your credit card, these are all conversations we are needing to have right now because we're sharing devices in ways that we might not have previously. Siblings are also sharing devices and they need some rules for privacy and appropriateness uh, with doing that. All of us need to uh, choose, choose our battles right now with our kids and really decide what is safe and what's not safe. If we're gonna green light something like TikTok where kids can be very public and share very publicly, maybe all the videos need to be made in the living room where um, we might worry less about kids doing something wildly inappropriate and sharing it. Maybe mom or dad has to be the editor in chief though and see those videos before they get posted. If your kids are making a quarantine TikTok, this could be an incredibly creative time. So I'm not, I'm not here to like 
you know, say TikTok is bad. Um, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with TikTok, it's an app that used to be Musical.ly. Um, like on YouTube, kids can share there, but it's definitely um, a situation where parents want to be involved. And they're, like YouTube, it's also an unmoderated space where your kid could see some content that you definitely wish that they wouldn't, that you might not even want to see as an adult. Um, on the other hand, there's incredible creativity in these spaces. So for our, our older kids, they can be really sources of inspiration, sources of fun and humor. Uh, but ideally, we're having conversations with our kids. Part of mentoring is just, if you are in these spaces, if you've said to your seventh grader, of course, yeah, great, use TikTok, I love it, then ask them what they're seeing on there. Ask them how they've controlled their preferences. What kinds of content don't they want to see? Have they seen kids issuing challenges that are gross? Have they seen um, kids get really hung up on how many followers and likes that they have? This is a challenge with any social media, but these are good conversations to have with your kids. Uh, if you know that your kids are um, potentially in a place to share content with younger siblings, we really need to mentor them about what kinds of content not to share, right? So you might not like that your eighth grader has seen that kind of icky meme, but you might really not want them to show it to your first grader. So those, these are conversations we're all needing to have right now. Many of our kids were texting before, but I wanna address kids who are texting for the first time right now. And a lot of them might be texting a little bit in Google chat um, if they're using it with their class. And the teachers are doing a great job, I'm sure kind of setting the tone for what that looks like and reminding the students that he or she, the teacher can see those chats. But it's just important for kids to think about how they might sound. Uh, I saw, and a lot of our kids are also a bit too informal on email, so we need to kind of teach them a little bit of the difference between email and text. So for example, I saw my son was about to send an email to his computer science teacher because he was locked out of Scratch and he needed to get the password and he was writing to her without a salutation, without capitalization, anything, and sort of like he would write a text message to a peer, um, but he's so new at it that uh, it didn't sound very nice. And it wasn't, it wasn't that he was being sort of intentionally rude or flip, it's just that he was bringing these conventions of very informal speech um, and hastily contacting her. And so I went over what we do in an email, you know, dear Mrs. Smoller, um, I'm so sorry I've lost my password. Is there a way I can get back into Scratch? Thank you so much, you know, my name here, right? So it's important to go over those conventions with kids um, and talk to them about how to communicate and also how to communicate with classmates. If they're being called on to give feedback to classmates, you obviously never wanna be mean about feedback, but you also wanna make sure that you're communicating in a way that comes through. The challenge with text, and this is true also for kids who were texting before, is that our facial expression and our tone doesn't come through. So it's very important to work on conflict resolution. In the regular world, the world I hope is coming back soon to Minnesota and everywhere, is uh, I would say you wanna work these things out face to face. If something has gone wrong in a text, you wanna go up to that friend the next day at school and say, are you mad at me? Are we cool? Is everything okay? Or I made that joke last night, it seems like it upset you, what's going on, are we cool? But now you've got to FaceTime that friend <laughs> and, and we'll at least have most of the cues that we would have had in that locker conversation. But it's very important for kids to understand that once things go wrong in a text, it's very hard for them to go back right without some kind of communication that's you know, in real time and not text. And the worst thing you can do when you're in a conflict with someone with texting is to screenshot it and show it to other people to try to involve them in your conflict. So this is true whether or not you're stuck at home with your family during a pandemic, just in general, right? We also don't wanna text someone again and again and again and not be patient and wait for a response. I wanna talk a little bit about distractions while learning from home and then I'd like to take some more questions. So one thing that's really challenging is a lot of our kids are doing their recreational screen time and their learning screen time on the same device. If you have the option to disaggregate some of that and separate some of that, I'm going to suggest that that's a really great idea. One of the, my favorite things about the Nintendo Switch in my home is that I know what it is. In other words, every game on there is a game that I approved. And furthermore, there's no confusion about whether we're doing homework when we're on the Nintendo Switch. Um, once you get to laptops and gaming and social media and everything being on a laptop or a tablet, and that's also the school device, it does get harder to know what's going on. So we really have to talk with kids about what needs to get done first before the recreational screen time and the social screen time comes into play. Um, if school and class is having a morning meeting that may fill some of that need, um, or if they're having some kind of meeting during the day, not everyone is doing synchronous every day, 
Um, but I just, I just want to suggest that uh, we just need to have that conversation with kids and that some kids are going to really struggle with self-regulating around what they're doing if they're doing a bunch of different really compelling recreational things on their device. Even though school is also compelling and awesome, your kid probably loves school or at least has certain subjects that they really love. Doesn't matter for most kids if they can also play Minecraft on that school device or do social media on that school device, that's going to be distracting. So the, that's part of the mentoring conversation is managing distraction. We never want to moralize to our kids about distraction because truly it's a problem we all have. And these devices are actually designed in some ways to have some really compelling distractions. We're all working at the site of the party. We've all sat down to our computer and done things uh, that are different than what we intended uh, and taken longer to get our work done because of it. So rather than approach it as a moral failing on our kids' part, we need to approach this as a shared problem that all humans have right now and that we can work together to solve, whether it's by turning off the Wi-Fi on the device for a short period of time while we free write, whether it's using an app that actually blocks the distracting apps, whether it's being sure not to double screen and putting our phone away while we work on a tablet or a Chromebook or a laptop. Any of these things can be helpful, whether it's turning the sound off on a sibling's device or putting the sibling on headphones while they're Google chatting with their class so that another sibling can be working in the same space and not be as distracted. This is gonna be trial and error, and you're gonna learn a lot in this time about your child as a learner, and he or she will learn a lot about themselves. This is an area to have a lot of grace with yourself and a lot of just calm and know that your child will be okay in the end academically. This is a time where mental health is ultimately more important than academic achievement. All of us, of course, don't wanna see our child lose months and years of hard won gain. Some of us have children who struggle in school. Some of us have children who get extra support in a certain subject. We worry about what our kids will lose and that's understandable. But nine out of 10 kids globally are out of school right now. Nine out of 10 kids. So the one thing I can tell you is everyone's in this together and everyone is going to go back to school whenever we do go back and have to do some review and some make, making it up. And also, even though your child may be pretty focused right now and the work that's coming home is really coherent and you're doing a great job facilitating it and you're in that fairly ideal situation or maybe one parent really has time or maybe one of you is a teacher and you're like, I've got this. Your kid is still going through some trauma right now and still may need to review some of this later because we know that the brain, when we're going through trauma and stress, has a harder time you know, putting things into that long-term memory. So I don't wanna, you know, say like throw up our hands and give up because that's not what we should be doing. But if your kid's not making the incredible progress in their foreign language or in math or in any subject that they were before, that's very understandable and it's not anyone's failing. So don't take that to heart and feel bad as a parent. Just recognize that we are all going through this collective experience. Your kid is doing his or her best in any given moment and so are you and so are their teachers and we will get through this, but I would really focus more on their mental health right now and how they're feeling about themselves and the world um, versus their academic achievement. That is so, so important. And uh, be open to those messages from teachers. If, if you hear from a teacher that they, they're concerned about your kid, um, if you're concerned, you can check in with teachers and the social worker at school. Um, everyone is doing their best, but this is also time if your child, especially an older child, uh, might be worried about a peer right now. We need to encourage our kids to let adults know if they see signs of, of anxiety and depression in their peers. This is not something any of our kids can carry on their own. Um, so they need to know that, that that's, it's time to talk to an adult. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about gaming and then maybe take some more questions. Um, we're all parenting already in the age of these incredibly compelling games, Minecraft, Fortnite, etc. These games are so, so compelling and sticky and hard to walk away from. A lot of parents might be asking, and I got some questions beforehand, how much gaming is too much? Well, it's too much of it's interfering with sleep. It's too much of it's interfering with your relationship with your child. Uh, it may be that your child's gonna have to learn some new habits after this, right? Because they may game a lot during this time. I would look at ways that the gaming can support friendships, ways that the gaming can support even physical activity. If you can get your kids into some games that support some movement, or if you want to buy some gaming time with your kids, if you're using those kinds of, you know, carrots and sticks and rewards, okay, if you want to play Fortnite, go run around the block three times, or, you know, you have to do a physical activity before you play. Um, 
those kinds of things. You want your child to get some balance. You want your child not to play games that have content that are too disturbing and too upsetting. Um, you know, there's a lot of apocalyptic games out there. Maybe those aren't the right ones, especially for younger kids right now. If your kid was playing it beforehand and you were fine with it and they're fine, great. Every kid is sensitive to content in a different way. Uh, my own son has watched the entire Star Wars, you know, every single Star Wars film and been fine, no nightmares, everything's great, started watching them at seven or eight years old. My parents took him to the Museum of Natural History and he watched a movie about dark matter and it was incredibly upsetting. And, you know, we're talking about like years of, uh, years of trauma and nightmares. <laughs> so you can't always predict the content that's going to be upsetting to your kid, but this may not be the time to introduce something that's new and scary given the, the stress we're under. Uh, I've heard about a lot of kids also regressing during this time with their gaming. So kids who are already well past Lego Star Wars going back and playing those with their moms and dads, kids who maybe had abandoned Minecraft going back, definitely and, and kids rereading Harry Potter, regressing in all the content, right? So going back, whatever's comforting. Um, my son was kind of poo-pooing the idea of Mo Willems' um, daily doodle because he was like, oh, Mo Willems, that's for little kids. And, but my son wants to draw comics and graphic novels. We watched a couple of the Mo Willems and then he, he got out some of those books and kind of looked at them and was like, okay, maybe I need to read these to my cousins right now. So um, don't forget that the, the content that we loved as younger kids can be very comforting at this moment. Um, that's the reason a lot of middle school librarians keep a couple picture books around. Right. Okay. I want to go to questions right now because I know uh, people may need to get toward bedtime and I want to, I want to honor that. So let me see. Tony, do you want right. to share yep. some questions? Yeah, this one's geared towards uh, some of our older students and uh, parenting strategies for distance learning or technology in general with, let's say, a high school student, 16, 17 years old. They don't like to have much uh, input or questioning about school or their online activity. Uh, parents want to respect boundaries, but also provide enough input to help the child succeed. How much yeah. is too much? How much is too little for that age group? Well, first of all, I would really look at how well was your child doing before with independent work? So were they pretty much managing their own projects if they needed to go meet with peers to like write a collective paper? Were they arranging that themselves? Um, if your child is pretty good at this and seems to be taking the reins, this wouldn't be the time to kind of hover because they're going to perceive that as a lack of trust. I would really pick your battles with screen time, bedtime, and schoolwork at this moment. Uh, I don't know what your grade policy is right now, but I know everyone understands that kids are going through a tough time and we all want to pull for our kids, you know, to graduate and to get through as much as possible. So that, um, obviously we can't just completely say, oh, don't worry about it, but this should put some of our intense fears around high schoolers and competition and getting into college into a little bit of perspective because now we're playing a new game and that game is like how to not die right and i, I mean I, and i say that like in all seriousness like you know if your kid was a junior and was obsessed with like how am i getting into you know the honors program at u of m or you know or princeton or whatever school was like keeping them up at night this is a little bit of perspective um you want to give them space to be a, an independent learner and you want to support them. This is also a time that you may be in more touch with their teachers. A lot of us are not in touch with our high schoolers teachers kind of on a regular basis. It would be more around conferences and you know the advisor. But this is a time where if teachers and parents can be in touch, especially for the big picture stuff, like if the kids are supposed to be say, checking in every day on a Google form and your kid hasn't checked in in a week, that would be a really good time. You know, you want to know that information um, because something needs to change in your house, even if it's a small thing, even if it's like, okay, you can't go down in the basement and play video games until I, until you've sent that Google form to your teacher and checked in and you, so, or, you know, really, really simple things like that. So just, you want to have that information. You want to know how it's going for kids who are struggling more or for kids who are really devastated, and I think a lot of our kids are, about missing prom, about missing the debate championship, about missing their softball season. Um, this is real. Your kids worked very hard to get where they are, to get on that team, to get, you know, to that place, um, to get to take that AP class they really wanted to take. And so we want to balance some just space to mourn and feel sad with the need to kind of keep going. And for most kids that, that keeping going is also gonna help them ultimately with their mental health. Um, this is a time to, to really help your child figure out like bare minimum what has to happen, otherwise you're in deep trouble and you're not gonna graduate. And then what, 
how much more can you put in? You know, would it feel really good actually to knock that essay out of the park? Would that be bringing, you know, how, how would that be? And to try to tap into some of that intrinsic motivation. I think teachers are doing a great job with this right now and reaching out in personal ways. If there's a way for um, kids to, to talk with each other and to make the work a little bit collaborative because they're missing each other. Um, so this is where, you know, maybe they can be on FaceTime and at least talking a little bit during work. You don't want it to go to academic dishonesty, obviously, and you, some kids may be quite distracted, but if your child is using some of the social, me social media, you know, during work, really look at how that's going. For a lot of kids, it's not going to work, honestly. But if you had a kid who was a real social learner and they were going to the library to study with friends or going to Starbucks to study with friends before, it may be that doing some FaceTime, you know, during a study session may actually help them get through. One thing that I do with colleagues all the time, my writer friends, is we do these Zoom write writing meetups where we're actually on Zoom and we're silent. We just write and we just hold each other accountable that way. That may work for some high school kids right now. And maybe we check in at the beginning of the hour and the end of the hour. So you can talk to kids about ideas like that to help them. This is where we don't want our kids though to go totally feral and totally disappear on us. Again, it may, be, it may make sense for them to sleep in, but if we need them to show up to help us with siblings, to empty the dishwasher, to get some things done, we, you know, to brush their teeth, to take a shower, we do wanna keep that going and that ultimately helps mental health. Um, another thing we can do is really give them a lot of grace and, and, and gratitude for the help they're getting. If you, if you do have a high schooler who's helping with younger siblings or helping with family chores or helping make dinner, I would, you know, really lay it on pretty, pretty thick with how great they are and, 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 you know, continue to mention how much this is going to feed them when they get out in the world, how they're going to be the kid on their dorm floor who knows how to make more than rum and how they're going to be the one whose laundry isn't wrinkled. Right, so this is an opportunity, even though it's like the, le the least independence your teen has had for years, ironically, it's also an opportunity to foster some of those independent skills because some of us have been so worried about our kids' academic achievement that we've been shielding them from chores and your kid has some time for chores right now. So let them, let them be helpful. So. All right, I have another one. Uh, do you have any suggestions for managing multiple age students um, one student might need significantly more help than the other, and the parents are struggling to find a balance with that. And then also rolling in uh, for those children who do need a lot of help or do need more support, but also the parents are trying to work from home and have trouble being able to find the time during the day to devote that energy and time that the child needs. Right. Well, one possibility is to, to move to asynchronous and even let your child's teacher know like, hey, the only time I've got right now to really work with my kid on math, you know, is Sunday, right? And that's, that's when my boss isn't pinging me every five seconds or that, you know, or evening or whatever. And, and none of that is ideal, honestly. I mean, especially evening can be tough on younger kids or even some teens because they're exhausted. But you have to go with what you have time for. And we also just have to say, I mean, if you have to let a teacher know, this is not possible for my family this week because we're really under stress and one of us just lost our jobs or one of us is a healthcare worker moving to a hotel and our family is really struggling right now. Teachers are understanding and they're going to get some of those messages from families. It's better if you can proactively at least communicate that as opposed to the teacher just wondering what's going on with this kid, why am I not hearing, why is this work not coming back? Um, but, but to just say, this isn't possible for us right now. What can we do until then? You know, I mean, everyone is doing their best, uh, but, but you may not be able to meet all of your kids' needs at home because you can't, you can't take the place of, you know, if your kid is at school seeing an incredible teacher who studied for years to be a teacher and you're trying to do your other job and you have three kids and your kid maybe also, um, Maybe we're seeing the speech language pathologist is seeing an incredible music teacher. I mean, there, there's that really funny um, uh, video that went uh, viral, this Israeli mom kind of pushing back and laughing at her kid's school for sending home sheet music for his, mu you know, his music class and saying like, I don't read music. Am I supposed to get a string band? And I think we have to take just a moment and just kind of laugh and say that music teacher just really wanted to share their the work and you know they're really good at what they do they wanted to send it home because they prepared it they don't expect you to have a string band at home they know you don't have an orchestra in your house and that your child is not going to you know have incredible advancement on the trombone right now they know that 
So I think it's really important. If you have a child who needs more than another sibling, if that other sibling is old enough to be spoken to separately, if you can go for a walk with that older child um, or that other child, because it may not be your older child that needs more, and say, you know what, this isn't really like super fair right now, and I'd love to find ways to make up this time with you, but you know that your brother, you know, is was really struggling in school before all this went down, and I, he just needs more from us right now, and I know that you'll be okay. You're a really strong reader, and I know like during the time when you're reading independently, I'm going to be reading with him, and um, it's not all fair and equal at the moment, but you know, maybe I can spend some time with you on the weekend and play your game with you a little bit and, or you can tell me a little bit about what you are reading and I can listen and, you know, or you can call grandma too. And if you can call those extra people in your lives who maybe really would love the attention. Um, again, any seniors in your family who are isolated right now or in your extended community, they might love to just hear your fourth grader talk and talk about whatever, you know, so your fourth grader who needs to talk and talk about whatever, but um, was doing really well academically and you're not really concerned about, um, you know, how behind they're going to be, and you need to work with that sixth grader, maybe the fourth grader is talking to grandma and just filling them in on whatever, you know, the latest and greatest. So uh, we want to be creative, but it's okay to level with kids sometimes and say, um, you know, equity doesn't mean everyone gets the same, right? And that's a lesson I think they get in school sometimes, but also uh, so can get at home. I don't know if y'all can hear it's hailing here. I'm just, I hope it's not too loud <laughs> in the background. Oh, these are some really epic times, everyone. <sighs> really, really epic times. Okay, other questions? Yeah, um, we, had, we had a question here about uh, what is your advice about quality work over completing the work too quickly, you know, right now? And is that something that you would differentiate by age? And for example, some uh, expectation might be that the work is going to be taking one to two hours and it takes a student 25 minutes and they feel they're done with it and you know that's yeah I mean I, I have a little rusher in my house who does this even during the school day and so you know the accommodation is that the teacher just gives it back when it's not done or when it's been rushed through I think again pick your battles right now so if you know that your child is kind of a rusher and they're rushing, especially toward a specific reward, then maybe it's like the fun screen time or the fun Lego time or the fun whatever jamming on your musical instrument time. That's at three o'clock, no matter what. Maybe it's not when you're done with this math worksheet. Maybe it's just like that's at three. And so you, you know, you can work on this math sheet that whole time. You can work on the math sheet and stare into space, but we, we don't always want to like just give that really fun thing to do right after it's done because that in incentivizes some kids to rush. If you know you had a kid who struggles with rushing, you, you may also want to just give it back to them and say, look at this again. I think the one challenge with asynchronous feedback that I'm currently seeing in my home, and I, I think this is just a real thing, is it's hard to take feedback a long time later when you're a kid, right? So, um, you know, if, you, if you're told to redo a math problem and it's like three days later, it, it can be hard because kids are like, wait, what was that, right? And so just acknowledging that that's a challenge, choosing where your kid maybe needs more, um, needs more support and, and really going into those areas to do redos and not maybe redoing everything if that's too hard to lift. And if your kid is pushing back, if your kid is compliant, go for it. But if your kid is yelling at you and pushing back and whining and you're getting a lot of behavior, which a lot of us are seeing right now, a ton of resistance. And a lot of us are wondering like, oh my gosh, is my kid like this at school? And the answer is probably not as much, <laughs> right? Because uh, teachers are really good at classroom management and also they're not you. Um, they're not the parent. And it's, it's really challenging to be the teacher and the parent, even for those of you who are professional educators, right? And I was a college professor for years. So, okay, I never taught fifth grade, but I've taught, I've taught things, right? So here I'm thinking like, I've got a PhD. I, sh I should be good at this. Well, A, the content, I don't know that well for fifth grade. My kids, and one of the things I've been saying to my fifth grader ever since this started, because he is kind of rocking it in some ways and other ways he's really struggling, is to say, I see how much more you know about being a fifth grader than I do. I see how much more you know, you know, your teacher's name, like her expectations than I do. I see, cause he understands, you know, he'll go to things and say, oh, I need to do this for common lit. And I'm like, I don't really understand the direction. She's like, I do. I've been doing this all year. I got this. So we want to acknowledge where our kids are the experts. And then again, pick your battles. If you don't have time today, then your kid may rush through some work. 
that may not be the end of the world. You may not want them rushing through the next three months of work, but on some days the work may be rushed. And again, teachers understand that parents may not be able to be with kids, multiple kids all day long, supervising the work, forcing them to redo it, all of that. So when you have a kid who's crying, when you have a kid who's pushing back, when you have a kid who's throwing a tantrum, it's time to pull back and, and give them some autonomy as well and say, okay, how are we going to get through this, right? We cannot be the heavy with our kids right now all day, every day on every single thing. We have to, something has to give, right? So as, if your kid is sleeping, if they're eating, if they're taking care of themselves and they're showing up and doing some school, that may be the best we can expect right now. Other kids may be super anxious about school and worried about how well they're doing. And those kids actually may need to be given the message that it, this is okay. And it's, you know, don't, don't stress so much about school because there are kids who are going into hyper anxious mode too about how well they're doing. All right, more questions. Yes, uh, this would be referring to a learning space question. Is it a bad idea to allow kids to do their schoolwork in their rooms or a comfy space if that's the only way they'll cooperate? Is this a battle I should even pick? I would say if that's the only way they'll cooperate and you have that kind of space, that could be great. I would be cautious about keeping connected devices in there overnight if this work is being done on a connected device. And I would, if you can do some spot checks on what's happening, the younger the kids are and the more, um, the, the bigger the differences from what you were doing before, like if the iPad or the tablet or whatever was going in the room sometimes before and it was, you know, okay, then I would be less concerned. If you have a kid who's never had that kind of freedom, I would do some spot checking on how it's going. And I would let them know that if you see things that are concerning, um, then that privilege might get revoked. But I would also, say if that's the way for them to be away from the siblings or away from the melee in, in, in the house and it's working, that's great. Um, you know, I live in a very small apartment with my family and I would be grateful to have more space to send my kid to do more things. So in some ways, like having that space to spread out may be how they, they focus. I do think you probably wanna keep the learning to like one or two spaces just to not lose things. And especially the more kids you have, the more space you have, you probably don't want your kid like starting on the couch, moving to another room, moving to another room, um, I would rather see them take exercise breaks and go outside, but keep the work in one or two places just so they don't start to lose everything, especially if they are doing some paper pencil pieces and have, you know, or have books or other, th other things that they can lose. All right. And this one uh, might be a good one to end on. Uh, are there uh, any great skills that the kids will learn due to our current reality? What will they have learned because of this and will make them more successful and resilient in the future? Wow, I think that kids will, will learn a lot about their relationships with themselves and how to be with themselves as well as how to be with others. And I also think that kids will learn a lot about doing things for the social good because we're all staying home for the social good and that's a hard one to really process. And I know even you know as adults, it can be a struggle. Like it seems like it would be a good idea. I just I wanna go to Whole Foods and touch everything. Um, and uh, you know, go to the farmer's market and touch everything. So I resist you know, in, my, in my heart what we're doing. And then I also think they're gonna learn who they are as learners. And I'm already seeing that with my own child and I'm hearing about that from other parents that there may be some skills your child picks up and it's not even gonna be about the skill themselves, but the resilience and, or the independence to learn that skill. The, you know, I wanted to learn how to cook this. I saw the video on YouTube and then I cooked it. Or I wanted to try, you know, to make this cool thing. And I, you know, thought about it and I did it. I wanted to make a book. I made the book. I wanted to compose something on the guitar. I taught myself how to do it. Seeing what our kids actually gravitate to when they are bored, when they don't have as many choices, um, will be interesting for them and will be something that they can always come back to. Certainly they're gonna have some good stories to tell their own children someday. Uh, and that's, that's why we're doing this, right? So that can happen. So I guess I'll, I'll stop there. And um, I'm so grateful to you for bringing me in to talk with the community. And please feel free to go to my website. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you're into that kind of thing. And also keep talking to other parents and make sure that you're doing some self-care every day, even if it's two minutes of deep breaths in the morning, um, even if it's just savoring the taste of whatever fruit you have left, anything that you can do 
um, to support yourself also supports your children. So as much as we want them to exercise, we need to exercise. As much as we want them to balance the content they're you know, reading and taking in, we want to do that for ourselves because ultimately our mental health supports our whole family. So take good care of yourselves right now. I know this is a really, really hard time and I'm thinking about you all. Thank you. Thank you, Devora. As always, this was so valuable. And once again, I learned a lot from you, um, as I always do. I did want to, there was one question in here um, that was specific for our schools as opposed to you, and it had to do with um, Madamina High Schools helping our, our kids connect um, through book clubs or project groups. And so what I wanted to just comment on is that all of our teachers are going to be connecting this week in our elementaries. They're going to be connecting with parents to find out how things are going and uh, get just getting feedback on how the classes are, how the pace is, what kinds of things are happening at home that they need to know about. At the secondary level, our teachers are going to be reaching out to the kids and having those same conversations. And so I would encourage you to to talk to the teachers, just like um, Devorah mentioned, reach out to the teachers, let them know what you're thinking, what you need, and encourage your kids to do it as well and talk about what are those things they need because um, helping them know who they are, who they are as a learner and what they need is going to really contribute to how they are independent learners in the future. So I encourage you to do that this week. So thank you again, all of you for coming. Um, best of luck to you. And I hope you're all doing well and taking good care of yourselves. And um, thank you to our teachers who are on the line today too. Um, we know that they have been working very hard to, to give you the best they, can po they possibly can. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, it's been a pleasure to be with you all. Thanks, Devora. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.